Anyway. Anyway. Back to the topic at hand. Anyway. Murder. Murder. Hi, I'm Alison Gwynn. Hi, I'm Amelia Cormack. And you're in Some Dark Holler. <laughs> I'd rather be in some dark holler where the sun refused to shine than for you to be. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy Christmas, as they would probably say. I like happy Christmas because it made me sound like a, a Brit. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So this kid from East Tennessee that's like, well, happy Christmas. Have you ever heard them say, uh, Brits talk about crimbo? Yes. Yeah, that's what they call Christmas as Merry well. Crimbo. Crimbo. Oh, yeah. crimbo. So Merry Crimbo and Happy Holly Bobs. And whatever. also... Happy early birthday, Ms. Allison Gwynn. Me and Jesus and Annie Lennox have the same birthday. And Shane McGowan, may he rest in peace. <laughs> Too soon? Sorry. For those unaware, Shane McGowan of the Pogues. Yes. The infamous, famous, the it was Christmas Eve, The first time I heard his voice was... I was a very big fan of that movie, uh, Circle of Friends. <gasps> oh, it's, come on. I love it's it. Like, it's like marching me up to the top of the, the mountain and showing me the world and, and marching, marching me back, back down and saying, that's, that's what you can't have, Benny, you great big fat article. Here's what you can have, not Glenn, for the rest of your life and marry to Sean Bloody Walsh. This is why we're to a bloody blizzard. This is why we're friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, that right there is why we're friends. I was obsessed with that. Obsessed. Movie. Anyway, well, Shane McGowan and Enya. Enya's born on Christmas as well. well. No, no, they did oh. a they did a duet oh, they did. Oh. during the credits. I think it sounds like Enya. It may not be Enya, oh. but it sounds like Enya. Um, and it's like she starts it, so it's like. I knew I loved you for the first time in my life, and now I love you. And darling, I know you're the one. <laughs> I was like, did Rolf the dog just walk in? Oh. Oh well. Oh well. <sighs> this, this is basically the reason, reason why we're talking about. We're just very much going to date this episode um, because it is. We are recording right before Christmas, um, but we also have a very exciting like bumper. Bumper episode for you. Oh, yeah. This one's going to be a two-parter, friends, because yeah. I did too much research. <laughs> there is no such thing. And Alison was a bit nervous. She's like, is it too early? I said, absolutely not. Give the people all the information. Let's 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 go to Geek Town. It Buckle might up. be just me, though. I might just be being greedy because I love to hear a story. And so I want to hear the whole story. Well, hopefully you will, too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Well, this is a wild one. Yeah. Well, they're all wild. But, yeah. you know, this will be a two-parter. That being said, let's get to our sources. Yeah. My main source of research is from this excellent book entitled Naomi Omi Wise, Her Life, Death, and Legend by Hal E. Pugh and Eleanor Minock Pugh. And they're native to Randolph County in North Carolina. That's where our story takes place, by the way. Okay. And they're historians. They also have a family connection to this song in terms of who wrote it. Ooh, cool. They have researched the heck out of this. Upside down, inside out. It's so them. thorough. Well done. Very good. If you have a chance and if you want to read it. Do. It boggled my mind. I was like, everything I want to know is right here in this book. There we go. It's Don't so need funny to. how that happens sometimes. Yay! Also, a big thank you to Dr. Ron Roach, Chair and Professor of the Department of Appalachian Studies at East Tennessee State University, and also uh, Ted Olson from the Department of Appalachian Studies 
he led me to one of the earliest recordings of the song. The earliest recording of the song is in 1926 by a man named Vernon Dallert. So, so thank you, gentlemen of ETSU Appalachian Studies. I will post that version of the song with many other versions in a Spotify playlist under my name, Allison Gwynn, A-L-L-I-S-O-N-G-U-I-N-N. And the title of the playlist will be Poor Omi, O-M-I-E, Wise. All other pictures will be posted and cited on our Instagram page and other links like to YouTube links on our show notes as well. So remember if you listen to the first two episodes when we say, don't go down by the river. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This song is why. Okay. Very much so. This episode is about one of America's oldest murder ballads. The original murder takes place in North Carolina in 1808. So this wow. is an old one. Yeah. And it's the story of poor Naomi Omi Wise. And we're going to sing it uh, right now. <gasps> They sent for John Lewis, John Lewis came by. When faced with her body, he broke down and cried. You can shoot me, you can hang me, for I am the man. A drowned little homie in yonder's old mill stand. My name is John Lewis, my name I'll never deny. 
A drowned little homie, I'll never reach the sky. Wow, you were great. That was that was Amelia on the fiddle. And Allison on the auto harp. So here we go with our quote drowned woman theme, end quote. So many murder ballads have this theme. And it seems like back in ye olde days, one of the more drastic forms of birth control was taking your lover to the river and drowning them when they got pregnant. What? There are so, I'm, I'm kidding, but there are so many versions of this story and song. Like, uh-oh, I got my girlfriend pregnant. No way out of this. I'm going to go drown her. I mean. So many versions. It's not enough that the actual act of childbirth would kill, like, it was a, a le- lethal right. process but anyway. If they made it to childbirth, then they would know that you had sex outside of marriage, and that's a scandal. So let's secretly take them by the river and drown them. Yeah, I this is this. I'm just I'm just giving you a warning as a as a pregnant woman listening to the story. There may be tears. There may be yeah. a lot of emotions. So hold yeah, hold on, hold what you I'm hold, so, to I'll, I'll hold. Hold, hold my, on to hold her, baby girl. Hold on to her. Yeah, because back then, yeah, a lot of shame was involved in having sex before you were married. Which is so, and this is a little bit of a side note, but what's so fascinating is you look at the difference in England between Georgian England, which is around this time, and Victoria, because the it was kind of not that bad to be having sex before marriage. Right. Like the, it was kind of celebrated, not celebrated, but you know, had authors like Henry Fielding writing mm. these romps of, and it, there yeah. was a real enjoyment of sex and sexuality and then Victoria comes in and Albert dies and it's it all gets right. shut down. Especially when you get to America, Puritans. And that's why I think that it, diff- it was probably different here because yeah. that. This is a initial... country uh, taken over by Puritans. Yeah. Whereas Australia seems cool. <laughs> it's taken over by uh, convicts. Yep. We were taken over by Puritans. Yeah. That took over the indigenous peoples of America. Yeah. And, yeah, I digress. So there are a lot of these songs. There's By the Banks of the Ohio, which we might cover. Uh, we could we could have a series. We could have a podcast just about drowned women alone. There we go. Uh, yes. Um, this episode is brought to you by Planned Parenthood. Yes. God Please bless them. have a better plan than this. <laughs> If you got into the river, rethink, yeah. rethink. Run. Uh, right. Like I said, the most popular version of this song is by beloved folk singer Doc Watson. And although I can't find it on Spotify, probably because he doesn't have his songs on Spotify, uh, Bob Dylan does a version, and that, we'll link that on a, on a YouTube link. Yeah. And at the end of his version, he claims to have made the song up on a train. That's very Bob Dylan of him to say. I I just made this song up. This song is hundreds of years old, and you're just like, I made it up on the train. Mr. Dylan. Is Bob Dylan going to come for us? (laughs) Why would he come for us? We have no money to come for. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Uh, The Doc Watson version has a melody that's haunting and sounds as if it were written by an, an, an old English bard. However, the earliest versions were sung to the traditional hymn of How Firm a Foundation. Oh, okay. You know that? No, I don't. Hold on, pause. So she listened to it and. You yeah, know. it's a much more major key. How firm a foundation. Snore, snore, <laughs> snore. <laughs> yes. Um, so how firm a foundation, I guess they didn't, they didn't have a lot of creative license or, or imagination and come up with your own song. Why you gotta, yeah, I guess maybe Although the song will travel better. That's what it's... I mean. That's what I was going to say. Cause every, everyone knows the hymn and you say, oh yeah, just try putting these words to it. And yeah, then everyone's and then like, just sing it on. oh yeah, that's, that's probably better. Like, let's call it a, a ye olde earworm. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, poor Naomi Wise's story, it seems, was somewhat, when I say somewhat, very romanticized, and the facts of her life were fictionalized to make her more palatable of a heroine 
in a very popular publication of her story by a man named Braxton Craven. Ooh, that's a good because of present company, we want to call him Braxton Hicks a lot. <laughs> but yeah, which is a form of con- false contraction. Yes, true. Um, that's really funny. I like that. But Braxton Craven is this Braxton person. Craven. Um, it's interesting that with Omi, we're going the opposite way to what they did with Frankie. Yeah. So with he with this one, they want to make her seem more virgin because she's the she's the victim. Yeah. Braxton Craven, we have to remember his name. He wrote a version of the story and and song. He uh-huh. wrote the lyrics of the song after the story. And uh, his version of the story and song became so popular that it is thought of as the true story to many. Uh, let's tell you a little bit about him. Braxton Craven was a professor and well-learned man that decided to champion Naomi Wise and make her a fairy tale damsel of sorts. Why? Probably because, like Naomi, Braxton's own mother was an orphan. But unlike Naomi, Braxton's mother was impregnated at 19. Mm -hmm. It is likely he projected his feelings of pity for his own mother onto Naomi Wise, making her a fresh, innocent 19-year-old in his version of the story. Although evidence would show up that later painted a more accurate portrait of Naomi and her unfortunate demise. I will say, Naomi is not a, a name that you I have heard often associated with this period. Yeah, I feel it, like I don't, I, I have not seen Maybe many, it's biblical, isn't it? I don't know. I think so. I don't want to quote anything, but, you know, there's a lot of Elizabeths and Victorias and Marys and Janes. And sure. You don't often, often, I don't think I've ever heard of a Naomi from this time, which is cool. So we're going to start with this version. I'm going to tell you the Braxton Hicks Craven version. Braxton Craven (laughs) version of this story. Or what I like to call the Disney fairy tale version. Great. From the publication, this is the big publication. It's called The Evergreen, January through February edition in 1851. And all of the quotes from this story will be from that publication um, going forward until I... Until I say otherwise. (laughs) He sets it up like a Disney movie. Now, I can't sing the Disney movie because copyright will take us down. But imagine a little town um, (laughs) in a town containing, quote, a few families of nature's noblest qualities. In Randolph County, North Carolina, lived the Adams family. No, not that Adams family. (laughs) It was... The family of William and Mary Adams, and they were Quakers. Oh. They were not, quote, emphatically rich, but were what our people call good livers. Not emphatically rich. Not <laughs> emphatically rich. I found that. that this is, what is emphatically rich? Is that someone I, saying, look at my necklace? Just, just look at this. <laughs> Sorry, so they were not emphatically rich, but were what our people call good livers. Honest, hospitable, and kind. They knew neither the luxuries nor the vices of high life, but they made enough to satisfy their families and to make a comfortable living. He goes on about the forest. The Mm. wild forest hills and immense glades in the neighborhood afforded a beautiful quantity of game, whilst the deep river abounded with the finest fish. Wow, this is practically biblical. I know. At William Adams's lived Naomi Wise. She had been thrown upon the cold charity of the world, and she had received the frozen crumbs of that charity. Oh, her figure, beautifully formed. Her face, handsome and expressive. Her eye, keen yet mild. Her words, soft and winning. How does he know any of this? He doesn't. He <laughs> Spoiler alert, he doesn't. (laughs) She was left without a father to protect, a mother to counsel, brothers and sisters to love, or friends with whom to associate. Food, clothing, and shelter must be earned by the labor of her own hands. A lovely girl, just blooming in all the attractiveness of 19. Ew, that's that's gross. I don't like that. (laughs) It's like, oh, God. Just any flower analogies from oh, a man ready. at this time. Oh, get ready. It's just gross. For some white man explaining. Oh, God. Those serving as a cook, 
and sometimes as an outdoor hand, she was the light of the family and was treated better than such persons usually are. Oh, end quote. You know, at this point, I expect like mice and birds to come out. Yeah, and help that's her what I was trying chores. to do some, some like, bird sound effects before. I don't know if like, that read. It's uh, very Cinderella. Yeah, oh, that's exactly what was going through my yeah. head. She was the servant for the Adams family. Did no, not I, that Adams oh. family. And they were fair and amiable to her and gave her a place to stay, clothed, and fed her in exchange for her labor. Okay. So she was a servant. Yeah. And then Braxton Hicks Craven doesn't have a hick. <laughs> then he turns around and sets up our villain. Oh. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. The Lewis family settled on Sandy Creek in North Carolina. Quote, the Lewises were tall, broad, muscular, and very powerful men. Oh. End quote. They were prone to fighting and winning by any means necessary. He goes on to say, quote, gouging, scratching, and biting. A Lewis was not to be vanquished. Oh. The family were the lions of the country. Is it just me or is he fetishizing them just a little bit as well? Eminently pugnacious. Oh, I like that. They rode through plantations, killed their neighbor's cattle, took fish from other men's traps, oh. said what they pleased, all more for contention than gain, end quote. So they were assholes. <laughs> I was just about, you literally took the words right out of my mouth. They were assholes and they liked it. Yeah. And from that family tree sprang Jonathan Lewis. Dun, dun, dun. No. Jonathan Lewis was clerking for a lawyer by the name of Benjamin Elliott in nearby Asheboro, North Carolina. Uh -huh. And on his way from his hometown of Center, North Carolina to Asheboro, he would break his journey around what is now New Salem, but right. um, it hadn't been named New Salem yet. But he wasn't out, like, stealing the other things like the other ones. Well, not... Well, he, he had a job. He, he did have a job. He did. And he was trying to make well for himself. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm, you know. Jonathan was, quote, goes on, a large, well-built, dignified-looking man. He was young, daring, and impetuous. End quote. I mean, again. So he's basically Gaston. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but also, there's, there, there's definitely some he has a some crush on this. He has a crush on this guy. Yeah. He, he goes on further and he says, such men, quote, such men are capable of anything. Once engaged, they are champions in the cause of humanity. But once let loose, like unchained lions, they tear to pieces both friends and foes. The greatest men are capable of the greatest scourges, end quote. So basically every bad boy that you dreamed of when you were a teenager. He's a rebel. <laughs> like, every... He's a loner, Dottie, a rebel. Oh. He says, when the two met, it was love at first sight. And he became a frequent visitor at Adams' house. And Naomi's heart, quote, beat with a new and higher life that she was loved by a man so powerful as Lewis. Naomi was blooming in all the charms of early womanhood. Mm. Her love for Lewis was pure and ardent, and the rumor was abroad that a marriage was shortly to take place, end quote. From what historically yeah. s says, uh, maybe about a year. Okay. Okay, and then here comes a shadow is cast over our young lovers in the shape of dun 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 Jonathan's mother. <laughs> okay. She didn't approve of Naomi and thought she was beneath her son. Quote, her ambition and avarice projected for her son a match of a different character, end quote. And she, Jonathan's mother, arranged for Jonathan to marry his boss's sister. Oh. And his boss's sister was named Hetty Elliot. Okay. Now, Hetty Elliot just sounds like a wicked stepsister to me. Yeah. It's like, or Nellie Olson from Little Hattie, House on the Prairie. Is, like, Hetty is H-E-T-T-Y? H-E-T-T-I-E. -E. E, yeah, so yeah. usually short for Henrietta. Yeah, but Hetty. But Hetty. 
in I had North a friend Carolina, named- Hedy Elliott. Oh my gosh, I can just hear it. I had a friend at um, I had a friend when I was at university, and her name she was a Henrietta that when she was Hetty. Was she? No, she was lovely. Okay, she good. was very talented. Well, that's good. Um, but uh, no, it yeah no I, I I definitely I see that I see her in a bonnet. Hetty yes, Elliot. yes, like, like with a sour expression on her face. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> her name sounds like she's frowning. <laughs> Hedy Elliott. Yeah. Aside from my assessment, she is described as by Braxton as quote an accomplished, beautiful woman of charming manners. End quote. So sorry yeah, for the hate okay. on it. Sorry, Hedy. The Elliots were a well-to-do family, and a match with them would be a step in the right direction for Jonathan to start climbing up the social ladder of success and high standing. Mm-hmm. So, unbeknownst to our heroine Naomi. Jonathan started to court Hetty Elliott, and his advances were received positively by Hetty, or she didn't know about Naomi either. Uh, uh-huh. It's Doug. See, Braxton explains, Jonathan loved Naomi for all the right reasons. Quote, Lewis loved Miss Wise for herself. No selfish motive moved his heart or tongue. This would have been a union of peace and joy. End quote. But he courted Hetty for all the wrong reasons. Quote, he wished to marry Miss Elliot, not because he loved her, but influenced wholly by other base considerations. End quote. Well, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't be playing advocate for him, but the, those considerations at this time yeah. are way more important because it's about the dowry. And it's, you know, if they're a family that are trying to get some social standing, then... Yeah. You know, I mean, we all like to that romantic thing of like, marrying for love, but the, it was tough for those people that did marry for love. If this had ended differently, it would be very much like um, a Jane Austen situation. Yeah, <laughs> but that's not how it what happened. Mm. Um, but it's also very interesting for Miss, our friend Mr. Craven to sit there in judgment and be like, oh, he didn't go with the poor girl be, for base considerations. I'm like, dude, you know, it's a lot more complicated. He's a tapestry that. here yeah. of. A fairy tale. Yeah, he, totally. You can see him doing it. Uh, what's morally good and who's pure and who isn't. And Yes. So he goes on. And so Jonathan chooses the dark side and no longer and was no longer a good man. But Braxton describes him as, quote, a hard-hearted, merciless wretch. Oh. A hyena skulking about the pathway of life. Jesus. Ready to kill the living and to tear the dead from their graves. Oh, my God. End quote. That's some necromancy shit. Wow. Wow. He's, he's giving him magical powers. Wow. I know. Like, Okay. Calm down, Braxton. Yeah. What he did was bad enough. You don't have to, like... Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan continued to two-time the ladies with every intent of marrying Hetty, but carrying on with Naomi. Mm-hmm. Now, Naomi is painted as a pure flower crushed under his foot. Which I guess is metaphor because back then people didn't talk about sex. Yeah. So the crushing meant that Jonathan had not only deflowered Naomi, but had gotten her pregnant. (sighs) Now, Naomi still believed that Jonathan was going to marry her when he began to delay for unknown mysterious circumstances. (laughs) Eddie, she threatened to take him to court. Oh, wow. So that's that's good. Come on, Amy. Do it. Yeah. You'd think that, that Braxton would be like, she just cried a lot and <laughs> sang a song about it. Yeah. <laughs> While the mice comforted her and brought her tea. <gasps> so, but no, she threatened to take him to court. Naomi wasn't doing a good job being secretive because the rumor that she was pregnant somehow got back to Hetty. Oh. And when Hetty confronted Jonathan, he denied it and said the rumor was, quote, a base, malicious slander circulated by the enemies of the Lewis family to ruin his character, end quote. Jonathan, being painted into a corner, devised a plan. Not a good plan, but it was a plan. Not a plan, yeah. Jonathan calmed Naomi by assuring that they would get married, and they arranged to meet down by Adams' spring at night, and they would elope to the magistrate and make an honest woman of Naomi. Oh, uh, Naomi was overjoyed and told her mistress, Mary Adams, her mistress, her employer, or whatever you call her. Yeah. But Mary had her doubts and advised Naomi not to trust him. I mean, she's got that woman's intuition. 
Yeah, she's probably Mary's been around. She's like she knows. This she's doesn't... seen that. She's seen that cad hanging around. I've seen that trifling. I've seen trifling before. I'm not talking about the dessert. <laughs> seen both trifles. <laughs> There's a lot of trifling going on. I love trifles. <laughs> In and out of the oven. <laughs> Naomi naively refused to believe that Jonathan would be untrue and happily went about her plans to meet with him. Oh, this is very gosh. West Side Story. Tonight, we're not going to get sued. Um, <laughs> that's, I mean. And as the evening set in, Naomi set off for Adams' spring. Happy as a lark to the arms of her love, he arrived on horseback and she got behind him and away they rode to their fate. It wasn't too long before Naomi noticed that they were taking the river road that led to the Deep River. That's the name of it, Deep River. It's very imaginative. Mm -hmm. And not going in the direction of the magistrate. He slowed his horse to a walking pace, and then he asked her, get ready. Okay. Look, Naomi, which do you think is easiest? Uh, a slow or sudden death? <gasps> oh, my God. But again, this is Braxton. Just slow and yes, this is his. This version. is Braxton's. Oh, Jesus. are you ready? She replied, quote, "I'm sure I don't know, but what makes you ask me that question?" Why, I was just thinking about it. But which would you prefer, if you had the choice? I would try to be resigned to whatever providence might appoint, and since we cannot have choice, it is useless to have any preferences. Wait, 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 wait. What do you mean we can't have choice? I guess fate is fate, and you can't change fate. Oh, uh, okay. Providence is fate, right? Oh, I see what, yes, okay, I would be resigned to whatever providence might appoint, and since we cannot have a choice in our fate, it's useless to have any preferences. And, and, you know, He's like, pick your way. How would you want to die, Naomi? Just philosophical. Just out of, yeah. And not the victim blame, but why didn't she say, like, death by nachos or, <laughs> I don't know, uh, death by getting too much sleep? Or, <laughs> death by <laughs> feathers. <laughs> or death by loneliness, please get away from me. <laughs> Any of those. I would. Any of those are good. Any other way. It's death by stupidity because <laughs> she's not getting it. Oh, and hashtag he, Darwin Awards. Right. Wait, and he oh, goes I on. Have picked a blame. Oh, my gosh. I know, but this is not this her. This is not the real. This, this is Braxton's. I guarantee you this is not what happened. No. But this is what Braxton says happened. Yeah. Braxton Hicks Craven. Yes. He goes on. Well, Naomi, do you think you would like to know the time when you are going to die? She replies, finally getting... The hint that something's amiss. Why, Jonathan, what do you mean by asking me such questions? I have never thought of such questions, and you have never asked me such questions before. Okay, now I think we have the case of a male writer thinking all young, beautiful women are dumb as rocks. Yep. And that's what I'm chalking this dialogue up to be. So he replies. You can, I can just picture him twirling his mustache. Oh, yeah. Well, Naomi, I believe I know both the time and manner of your death, and I think it is in my power to give you a choice. Uh, That's when I would be uh, like, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> DEFCON 4, yep. DEFCON 4, get out of there. Please evacuate. The Lewis then rides his horse into the water and starts fording the river, crossing the river. And it, he says the water comes up to the horse's side. And then suddenly, Jonathan turns in his saddle to face her and says to Naomi in a husky voice, <clears throat> of course, quote, Naomi, I will tell you what I intend to do. I intend to drown you in this river. We can never marry. I found I can never get away from you. And I am determined to drown you. I mean what I say. You will never go from here alive. You cannot move me by words or tears. My mind is fixed. I swear by all that's good or bad, you have not five minutes to live. You have enticed me to injure my character, and you have made me neglect my business. You ought never to have been such a fool as to expect I would marry a girl such as you are. Didn't he say she had like five minutes left? <laughs> Yes. 
I, I would be like, do keep talking. Tell me more. Mm-hmm. Quote, you did not expect I was taking you off to marry you when you got up behind me. You no doubt thought I would take you to Ashboro and keep you there as a base. I don't know what that means. Like that Ashboro is the base. Like, oh. Ash- I don't I guess the, the, as, or it could be as a base, like, woman uh, oh like you're, you're a base you're my bit on the side oh no 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 like you know how oh as my cover well no i think it's as a as a base well i, I don't know base i'm just guessing base um that was good that was really good um no i mean you know when you say that someone is a low a low person you say yeah. they're a base person oh, yeah, so I, base. I wonder if he's using that adjective as a noun to all right yeah maybe I think it must be he's talking and keep you there, like the there as as there as a base is one thought that it's Ashboro that he's talking about. And then he says, "Prepare to die." Uh, oh, but oh, are you ready for her response? Oh God, <laughs> she can, she's breaking my heart. And then she carries on by saying, "Oh Lord, what shall I do? You know I have loved you with my whole soul, loved you." And when you betrayed me, I never reviled you. How often did I tell you that you did not intend to marry me? How many times did I beseech you to be honest with me? And after all, you certainly will not drown me. Oh, Jonathan, for heaven's sake, take me out of this river. Do, oh, do. Oh, spare my life. I will never ask you to marry me. I will leave the country. I will never mention your name again. And after all that... (laughs) Jonathan stops her by grabbing her throat. <sighs> then their struggles pitch them from the horse. He, okay, this is a physics lesson, so imagine this. Okay. He held her above the water, Uh huh. tied her dress above her head, <gasps> and then with his foot pushed her head down under the water and held it there <gasps> till he saw torches approaching. And then he mounted his horse and rode away. But wasn't he already on the horse? No, that when they were struggling, they uh, fell off the oh, horse right, right, right. into the river. So I guess he tied a knot. I guess to restrain her hands or something, he tied a knot in the top of her dress. Yeah, or he could. I mean, if he's if he's pulling it up above her head, tied that would also make head. it make it even more difficult for her to breathe. Would, maybe yeah. Cause it will help help her drown quicker. Cause I guess it would be like waterboarding. Wow. So it would be suffocation and drowning. I don't know if the wow. two happen at the same time. I don't know if that's scientifically. I'm sure if if we end up with some lovely forensics, yeah, uh, patho- pathologists who can enlighten us yeah. if both things can happen at the same time. Um. So in the end of it all, that was probably the wordiest brutal. murder I've ever heard. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of words. A lot of you're going to die, quoth I, any oh, minute no. now. But first, let me tell you why all the reasons I need to murder you. It's your fault, you see. And then she says, "Oh no, oh please don't do that." But it's also oh, heavens. But it's also in her speech is also that thing of like when you were mean to me before, I was really nice to you, and it's like, did you not know? Did, like, did you not get some idea if he was mean to you before that you know? Yeah. She's always got to be true to her man. Yeah, and I believe him. I can change him. Oh, how many times have we had that conversation with ourselves? I can change him till I drown. (laughs) Okay, so he rides away. The next morning, Mrs. Adams, so that's Mrs. Adams. Yep. uh, Morticia. Morticia wakes up. (laughs) Sorry, Mary. Quaker Quaker Mary. Yep. Wake Adams wakes up the next morning after a restless night, and Braxton has her dreaming that Naomi was calling her name or that she was seeing her corpse. She woke up, roused the town, and they began looking for her, first at the spring where they said that they Mm -hmm. would meet, and then they saw horse tracks, and they followed them with a search party until they met a woman on their way, Mrs. Davis and her sons. Now, Mrs. Davis reports to have heard muffled screams near her house by the deep river. And although she sent her sons down with torches, they could only hear the sound of a retreating horse on the opposite bank. So the search party went down to the river and they found the body. 
And when they approached the river, it was still tang- she was still tangled up in her clothing. Ugh. They got her ashore and laid her on a flat rock, which apparently can still be seen today, where they saw the marks upon her neck indicating that she had been strangled. And the coroner was sent for, and he declared her death, quote, drowned by violence, end quote. It was then decided that Lewis was the most likely suspect after Mrs. Adams revealed that Naomi told her previously that they were going to get married. And police went to Ashboro in pursuit because that's where she yeah. said they were going. Yep. Yeah. Going back to John Lewis. He's just drowned her. He's running away. He got out of there as soon as he saw the Davis brothers' torches and made for his father's house. Now, his mom met him and asked him, why are your clothes so wet? <laughs> and he said his horse had simply fallen while he was fording the river. What a clumsy horse. Oh, man. Uh, he changed his clothes and then did go to Ashboro. So, weirdly, he went to, uh, quote, sale, S-A-L-E, mm-hmm. at Mr. Hancock's place, end quote. I'm seeing, like, an estate sale, but I'm sure that's not what yeah. it is. Or it could be livestock. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but whatever that was, he went to a sale at Mr. Hancock's place, mm-hmm. you know, just after casually yes. drowning a woman. Yeah. Um, but you'd think he'd be in a hurry to get out of town or he'd lay low or, but no, he went to this sale and then proceeded to drink and even mingle with the ladies. Oh, of course. He mingled with the ladies as the night wore on and accompanied a young woman by the name of Martha Huzza. Huzzah. Huzzah. <laughs> Martha Huzzah to her home when the police found them in the living room with Martha on his lap. I mean, they do say, you know, we do know of killers that, you know, it, it is a, it is a, that are aroused by the kill. Yeah, Martha's lucky that they found her. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was arrested and then taken back to the scene of the crime, mm-hmm. the riverbank, where Naomi lay dead. A crowd had gra- gathered to see this. and. He laid a hand upon her face and smoothed her hair with no emotion in his face. Of course not. And that enraged the onlookers, and the police had to keep Lewis from being killed then and there by the onlookers. Right. They had very little evidence, such as Lewis's horse's hoof prints matched the prints leading to the river, and the hairs, horse hairs found on Naomi's skirt matches uh the horse, John Lewis's horse. That to me is harder evidence than because I mean, a ho- how yeah, like, well, how identif- individual are uh, hoofprints? Yeah, I was like, uh, especially if they've got horseshoes on, like right. And I'm also like picturing a cartoon horse like being fingerprinted and <laughs> like being chosen out of a lineup. Yeah, but anyway, no, the, horse hair, the horse hair makes more sense. The hoofprints, I'm like, nah, yeah, that's I mean, weird. The, the horse hairs on his pony yeah. led him to be jailed in Ashboro to await trial. However, oh. he escaped oh. the jail and fled to, quote, parts unknown, end uh-huh. quote, and was gone from the area. Time went on. We're talking years. Uh-huh. And if it weren't for the song, Omi Wise, which was sung in every neighborhood, this is according to Braxton Hicks, <laughs> Naomi's life and tragic death would have been forgotten. It was the popularity of the song, according to Craven, that spurred the case to be revived and John Lewis was sought after. It was rumored he moved to Ohio and married. Oh. His family. Sorry, Hetty. Right? My bad. <laughs> Hetty's probably very lucky, yeah. considering ooh, herself very ooh, lucky. Yeah. His family had all also migrated out of North Carolina and went to Ohio as well. Uh They hired two bounty hunters to go find him and bring him back, which they did. Wow. Turns out there wasn't enough evidence or witnesses stating that most of them had died or moved away. So, so much time had gone by. Wow. That people had died. Witnesses had died. I'm thinking Miss Davis, but... Yeah. Um, or moved away. Yeah. So, so they um, tried him for breaking jail instead. Huh. And he served a couple of years there. Right. And then, a af- few years after that, he finally dies. John Lewis dies uh-huh. a few years later. And Braxton 
has him being haunted by the ghost of Naomi on his deathbed. Mm. So much so that he confesses the murder to his father just before he dies an agonizing death. Mm. Once again, Rex and Craven making the villain suffer and be haunted by his evil deeds straight to the end. The end. Okay, so maybe Disney wouldn't option this. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe they wouldn't yeah, give him no. the green light. Yeah. But Braxton Craven's version of this was so... Well, I mean, you heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, flowery, romantic. Yeah. Verbose. Yeah. Very polarizing. He's the worst of the worst. She's the purest of the pure. Yeah. And that was the story that ignited the nation. Right. And that's the one everyone cling, cling to. Yeah. Um. So that's his version and the most popular version of the story and the song. Yeah, right. And wow. it's really, really different from what actually happened. Yeah, wow. What actually happened? Well, we'll find out in the next episode. <gasps> Allison leaving us on a cliffhanger. Yeah, we're going to get down in the next episode to the hard and gritty, the good, the bad, the feminist. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That that that's amazing. Um well done, friend. That's that's a really so, epic story. That was the the very flowery. Yeah. De flowery story. <laughs> That's this story told through a, an older white male. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. You see, I can see why they back then had to make, well, this was written in the 1850s. The actual murder happened in 1808. Yeah, and I'm also, I'm also thinking about the ethnicity of the people involved and the way that that's presented as right. well. Do you know the Quaker community very well? Uh, I know a little bit. Just, you know, um, um, I know about the friends and that they have the meetings where you go and you sit in silence. And that's, and the, nice. that's the cool part about them. I, I worked in an outdoor theater. One of my first professional theater jobs yeah. was at a Quaker outdoor theater run by Quakers. And then we did two shows. One was um, about the Quakers' involvement in the Revolutionary War. And one was about the Quakers' involvement in the Underground Railroad. Yeah, right. And... They were very ahead of their time when it came to equality and making sure everyone got a fair shake. There's that. Yeah. They seem very fair, and even though they had that Puritan mindset. Well, I know that a lot of the – because you, you, we did, did we, did we do the the ghost tour in Boston at Boston Common? Was that – or did that on Kinky Boots? Um, A lot of the people that were hung at Boston Common were also Quakers. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, and I'm sure, look, I'm sure if you were raised Quaker and you have some things to say, please let us know. But from the outside, it seems like a very peaceful, you know, equitable, like you said, equitable. And they were pacifists. That's the whole thing about Quakers is, like, they they were pacifists. They didn't believe in violence. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Wow. So. That's the the storybook Naomi. That's the Let's... storybook Omi. All right. Well, uh, if y'all want to, you know, work with us on making an animated feature film. I kind of dig that. Disney call us. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a cousin who used to work in animation for Disney. Only if I can Australia. play, like, who do I want to play? Hetty. Yeah, I... I would want to be Mary. Yeah, you'd be a good Mary. Mary feels like she's she the knows. Voice of reason. She knows. See, in our our musical group, I call <laughs> Amelia the voice of reason because I always want to do these kooky, crazy ideas, and she's like, "Whoa, those crazy horses! We're gonna whoa them a little bit. I'm not gonna stifle you completely, but we're gonna whoa slow the crazy horses down." I feel like it mostly manifests because you you like a faster tempo. Sometimes there's that too. There's that she... like in terms of ridiculousness. <laughs> I think she she keeps us in check for a lot for a lot of that, and I'm very appreciative. Of well, it. I hope I I hope I encourage as much as I. Oh yeah, yeah, you're great. But <laughs> like when it goes too far, you're like, okay, that's enough. <laughs>
Yeah, we're gonna save. We're gonna save um, the brilliant song that Allison has written, oh, um, inspired by kind. this, until the end of next episode. Um, but please, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can get in touch with us at our email, Cormac and Gwyn at gmail dot com, or on Instagram, we're at Cormac and Gwyn. She's really good at this. I would stumble all over that. We've got to make sure we've got good plugs. Yeah, you've got it. Yeah. You've got all the good plugs. <laughs> Electricity <laughs> running all through them. All right. So, I mean, we definitely did. This is the definitive lesson in. Don't go d- down by the river. Especially on the back of a horse. At night. And and don't, if someone veers off the direction that you're, it's like. Yeah. It's like if your Uber driver. <laughs> That's is. what I was thinking. Time. I'm like, if your Uber driver started going, looks like going... you're far away from your intended destination. Are you okay? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> um, but yes, don't go down by the river, even if he's very charming. Yeah, and the lion of the country or whatever. Yep. Or he looks like Gaston. Just don't do it. Yeah. No. And especially, don't find yourself in some dark hollow. <laughs>